today. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for, for how you, we can look back and we can see where you've always been there. Even when we were running from you and wanted nothing to do with you, God, you, you've always been there. You've always been protecting us. You've always been keeping us. You've always been providing for us, God, and we just want to say thank you. Now, as we, as, as we dive into your word for the next couple minutes, God, I ask that you open up our eyes so that we can understand, and not only that we can understand, but so that we can apply what needs to be applied in our life immediately, whatever it is. We could all be be hearing the same word, but it could, it could apply differently to our lives. There, there could be some people who, who need to be introduced to you as, as Savior. There could be some people who need to be introduced to you as Lord, God. But whatever it is, God, just reveal yourself in a mighty way this morning, God. <clears throat> Completely remove me. Allow the people to only hear you. We love you. We're grateful, God, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, like I said, it's just me this morning. I can remember back at a time when I was in grade school, man, it was, uh, I can remember when I, when I would walk into that classroom and, and if we had a substitute teacher, it was going to be a grand day. If we had a substitute teacher, it was going to be, but don't let it be, don't let the occasion be that I walked in the class and, and no teacher was there at all. There was no teacher at all. Oh, it's over. It's over. We had a party in there. I would look, I would look to my homeboys to my left and to my right and, and say, oh, it's, it's about to go down. And don't act like I'm the only one. Don't act like I'm the only one. AK, I know you feel me. Tony, I know you feel me. When we get that substitute teacher, it's over. And when there's no teacher in the room, it's a party. That's sort of how I feel right now. Dad's not here and Deke isn't here. We, if, if the church was here, I'd mess around and, and pop some popcorn and have the media team put a, put a movie or something on it and we would be chilling. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We, I, I do have another opportunity uh, this morning to, to preach the word of God. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. You see, in our society, although, although death is extremely prevalent, death is extremely prevalent and it occurs on a daily basis, it seems like people are less and less prepared for it. We saw last week the, the, the parable of the rich man in, in, in Luke 12, 16 through 21, but, but I want to focus on the part of verse 20 that says, in Luke 12, 20, but God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. The reality is, the reality is for all of us that no one knows when their last day on this earth is going to be. We don't know when our last day is going to be. It could be today. It could be next week. It could be 20 years from now. We don't know. But regardless of when we leave this earth, I think we can all agree that life is short. Life is very short. And when we hear those words, thy soul shall be required of thee, when those words come to us, we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared. James says in James 4, 14, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Job says in Job 14, 1, 2, man that is born of a woman is of what? Few days, few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. And so this morning, I, I, I want to talk to you from the subject. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for when God requires your soul? You see, in the text we saw last week, it was, it was said to the rich man that his soul was required. His soul was required. It was not specific whether or not his soul was headed to heaven or hell. It simply said his soul was required of him. And so when our soul is required, we won't have any time to try and get ourselves together. We won't have time to try and get our affairs in order because it's over. 
it's over. Paul says something interesting in Philippians 121, and we all have heard it. This is a verse we've all heard, but I wonder, have we ever taken the time to seriously consider what he is saying? Philippians 121, he, he says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We've all heard that very, very familiar scripture. And so let's deal with the second part of this verse first. Yes, yes, we've all heard it, but do we really believe it? Do we really believe that when we die, we actually will gain? We'll, we'll gain when we die. A lot of believers, we, we, they move through this life fearing death because they believe they're going to lose something. They, they believe they're going to lose. These are believers I'm talking about. And I get it. Death is not pleasant. Death is not a pleasant thing to, to, to think about. It's not an easy thing to think about. And when you talk about death, may, maybe the memories of, of a loved one or of a close friend, it, it brings up sadness. It brings up sadness in our heart because of their absence from us on this earth, which is 100% natural. There, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I believe it's because of that, it would benefit us to see why Paul says when we die, we gain. What is it that we actually gain from death? There are four things the Bible speaks about that, that, that we gain from death. And the first one we'll look at is that we gain a better body. We gain a better body. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. In other words, outwardly in our flesh, we're growing closer and closer to death. We wake up with, with, with aches and pains that, that come out of nowhere. We mess around and sleep on the wrong side of bed. Shoulder hurts, thighs hurt, knees hurt. And, and if you're not there yet, if, if you're still young, you haven't experienced that. As my dad would say, keep on living. Because you're going to experience it. We can't move as swiftly as we used to move. We can't, our, our vision and our hearing is, is failing us and our outward man is indeed perishing. But while this is happening at the same time, our inward man is being renewed day by day. Yes, our outward man, our flesh is getting closer and closer to physical death, but our inward man, our spirit is getting closer and closer to life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal, it must put on immortality. So we're going to gain, we're going to gain a glorified and immortalized, a resurrected body. That's something that we gain, age, sickness, and death. Those are inevitable accompaniments of this house made up of the dust of the ground and our bodies know it. Our bodies know that, our bodies let us know every single day that something is not right here on this earth. There, there are aches and groans within our body. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, he says, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is of heaven. We're groaning because we want to be clothed with our house, which is from heaven. Our bodies right now, they're, they're groaning to be clothed with the glory that we will receive in heaven. And this is why John tells us we should have an excitement and an expectation for our future. First John 3, 2, he says, beloved, now are we the sons of God right now, right now, 2021, February 28th, 2021. We are the sons of God. When he says that, he means daughters as well. We, we are children of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. It hasn't even appeared what we're going to be, <clears throat> but we know that when he shall appear, what? We shall be like him. We're going to be like him. This is why Paul could say to die is gain. It's gain. We know he knew what his future consisted of. He knew 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body. Why? Because it's to be present 
with the Lord. You see, Paul knew and he truly, truly believed this. It's, it's one thing. It's one thing to know something, but it's a whole nother thing to actually believe it. We can know one thing, but but until we actually believe it, change will never happen. When we truly believe it, we can say like Paul in Romans 8, 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Whatever it is that you're going through right now, it is not worthy to even be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul was so confident in this that he didn't even want to be on this earth. Paul didn't even want to be here. He, he was in a dilemma because he knew and he believed that life in heaven was so much better. He no longer had the desire to be here. Philippians 1, 23, 24, for I am in a strait betwixt two, having the desire to depart. I want to depart and to be with Christ, which is what? Far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. In other words, Paul wanted to be with Christ, but he knew the church at Philippi would benefit by him being there. So it felt like he was between a rock and a hard place. But can we say like Paul that 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 our desire is actually to depart and to be with Christ? Is that our desire? If we can't say that, let's let's change our thinking. Let's change our priorities. Let's change our pursuit in life so that we can say it. You see, the only reason we wouldn't be able to say this right now is because we love the world. It's because we love the world. We love the things of the world. So we can't say, I, I desire to be with Christ because we're having too much fun. We became too comfortable in the world, which leads to the next point. So we gain a better body, but we also, we, we gain a better home. We gain a better home. And, and, and some of you may actually have incredible homes, even right now. We, some of you may have incredible homes and in nice neighborhoods, but however beautiful and embellished it may be, it's nothing compared to our mansion in the city of God. It's nothing compared to the mansion. Jesus says in John 14, 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you what? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may also be. Jesus has prepared a place for us that is far better than where we live right now. And when we die, we gain that. In Hebrews chapter 11, where it talks about the, the faith of all the great women and men before us, notice what they were looking for. They, they, weren't, they weren't priding themselves and, and they weren't holding on to their houses and their cities down here on earth. No, ma'am, no, sir. They were looking forward to the one God was going to give them. When talking about Abraham, it says in Hebrews 11, 10, for he looked, he was looking for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is who? God. Three verses later, Paul says in Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were who? Strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they have been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. These men and these women, they were looking forward to the better home they were going to receive in heaven. And did you pick up what, what, on what that caused them to be on this earth? Since they were looking for their home in heaven, verse 13 says that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And that's exactly what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be strangers and pilgrims on this earth. But unfortunately, in 2021, it, it, it sometimes seems like we can't even tell the difference between the world and the church because they look the same. We look the same as the world looks and the world looks the same as us. But Paul tells us in Romans 12 too, and be not conformed to this world, 
but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Why, Paul? Why shouldn't we be conformed to this world? Jesus answered in John 17, 6, when talking about us, he says, they are not of the world. We are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We say all the time that this world is not our home. We say it all the time, but again, to say something and to actually believe something are two completely different things. If this world truly is not our home, then we should have a different perspective on leaving it. It it, it shouldn't be something that we fear. Leaving this earth should not be something that we fear. So we gain a better body, we gain a better home, and next we gain a better fellowship. We gain a better fellowship. You know, as, as, as we get older, we begin to lose more and more people around us. Parents have preceded us in, in, in death and friends begin to pass on and, and, and maybe spouses have transitioned out of this life before us. And it can sometimes seem like we're all by ourselves. We've lost that fellowship with family and friends and loved ones. We've lost that fellowship and it can get pretty lonely when our circle of family and friends is dissolving. And everyone that we knew and everyone that we loved is gone. But understand that the circle in heaven, where we're going, is unbroken. That circle is unbroken. There is no death or sorrow or pain or separation in heaven. And so we will get there and we will see all of our family and friends who believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior and preceded us in death. We'll see them. And this will give us a better fellowship than we could ever have on this earth. Why? Because it's forever. The fellowship that we will have in heaven is forever. You see, the fellowship we have down here on this earth is limited and it's temporary because we can die at any time. But in heaven, the fellowship will be amazing because it is eternal. We're not going to get to heaven and die again. We're going to get to heaven and be forever fellowshipping with brothers and sisters, but beyond seeing family and friends who wait to meet us there, we will see our Savior face to face. We're going to see our Savior face to face. See, right now, we can see him through his word, but it is still a little foggy. Still a little foggy because of the body of the flesh that's still on us that invades our thinking and prevents us from seeing Christ in the fullness of his glory. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. He says, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. You see, in heaven, like we looked at when we have a better body and this flesh is completely off of us, we will be able to see him for who he really is. John says in 1 John 3, 2, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Why? For we shall see him as he is. Then John writes in Revelation 22, 4, when talking about us, the servants of the Lamb, he says, and they shall see his face. Yes, it's going to be great to see family and friends who are in heaven already. But even better than that, we will see Jesus. The old song says, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing it will be when we all see who? Jesus. We will sing and shout the victory. So we certainly have a better fellowship in heaven. That's another thing that we gain in death. And the last thing is that we gain a better inheritance. We gain a better inheritance. In some families, when a parent dies, they typically leave an inheritance for their children. And whether it's land or or houses or or property or money, something is left for the children. And, And unfortunately, in some dysfunctional families, the children anxiously await the passing of their parents only so they can receive the inheritance. They they give me my money now or give me my land now or or some do like the prodigal son in Luke 15 12 and just says listen I don't even want to wait until you die just give me my inheritance right now there's nothing wrong with leaving an inheritance for our children it is biblical but what Paul is trying to get us to see is that in death we have a better inheritance our final inheritance is not here It is in heaven. Our final reward is not here. It is in heaven. 
Jesus says in Revelation 22, 12, and behold, I come quickly and what? My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And if you've been in Bible study with us, you know about these rewards or these crowns that God gives us at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul talks about one in 2 Timothy 4, 7, 7 through 8. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me, what? A crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You see, it's only beyond the gates of death that, that, that we hear the words of Jesus Christ saying in Matthew 25, 21, his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. We, we, we don't hear those words until after death. Who does not want to hear those words? Who doesn't want to hear those? Who does not want to hear Jesus say to them, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The only way we hear those words is based off of what we did with the first part of Philippians 1.21 which says, for me to live is Christ. You see, how are we living our lives? How are we living our lives? If, if for us to live is Christ, then to die will surely be our gain, and we've seen that this morning. We gain a better body, a better home, a better fellowship, a better inheritance. But if for us to live is money, then to die is our loss. If for us to live is pleasure, then to die is our laws. If for us to live is fame, then to die is our laws. If for us to live is self, then to die is our laws. If for us to live is ambition, then to die is our laws. If for us to live is sin, then to die is our laws. If for us to live is this world, then to die is our laws. And if I didn't hit yours, let me sum it up this way. If you are living for anything other than Christ, then to die is lost for you. Amen. To die is lost. Why? Because you've experienced the best that you will ever experience in your temporal and eternal existence. You've experienced the best you're going to experience. Up until this point, this message, what we're talking about, this message could only be applied and understood by a believer in Jesus Christ. You see, for the believer, we get a better body and a better home, a better fellowship, a better, a better inheritance. The believer gets all that. But for the unbeliever, the best of whatever you're going to get is happening right now because it only gets worse from here. It only gets worse from here for you. You see, hell is not a pleasant place. Hell isn't a fun place. The world jokes about it. The world makes a mockery of it. Hollywood tries to dramatize it only to find out that God is not playing. God is not playing games. He's not playing around. James told us earlier that our life is like a vapor and it vanishes and it vanishes right before our eyes before we even know it. And we saw that when God requires our soul, we won't have time to get ourselves together. We don't have time. The time is now. Right now is all we have. So if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, change that. Change that. Don't wait. Do it now because your soul could be required of you tonight. It could be tonight. Maybe you, you may have the same question that, that the Philippian jailer had in Acts 16, 30, 31, where he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And what did they say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou what? Thou shalt be saved. And if you think that doesn't apply to you, four verses later, Paul says, for whosoever, Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
That's something that can be done right now. That's something that can happen right now. And this life will immediately go from being the best it's ever going to be to the absolute worst it's ever going to be. And I'm not saying that this life is bad in and of itself, because I know that there are thousands of people who will pay good money to be able to trade places with us in the life that we have. But ir irrespective of that, your life goes from being the best it will ever be to now being the worst it will ever be. Why? Because as a child of God, we can only go up from here. We only go up from here, literally and figuratively. We only go up. If you're an unbeliever in Jesus Christ, believe in him. Believe in him and you can experience the better body, home, fellowship, and inheritance that we looked at earlier. But to the believers, I do have a question for you. I do have a question because although we are believers in Christ, we still can get caught up in living with the same mentality as an unbeliever where our pursuit is after the world and the things of the world. We can still get caught up in that. What could possibly be more important than our relationship with Jesus Christ? What is more important than spending time with him? What is stopping you from reading his word? What is getting in the way of you taking advantage of the opportunities to learn and grow in his word? You may respond, hmm, nothing really. I, I, I think I'm cool. I, I think I'm all right. I read the Bible for 10 to 15 minutes a day. I, I pray in the mornings. I pray before I eat and sometimes before I go to bed if if I don't doze off watching the good show I'll, I'll, I'll pray and maybe read a little bit more and I attend Bible study on zoom and I, I'm, I watch church service online and even even in that how convenient is that how convenient is that all we got to do is roll over on our bed I joked with our Bible study class a couple weeks ago there may be some of them that don't even brush their teeth before hopping on zoom don't even watch their face don't even have to turn on the camera that's so convenient but still, people don't even do that. Don't even turn on a computer screen. But let's be real, that will be the response from some people. They think they're cool because they're doing all that. But let's think about it this way. God allows everyone to have 24 hours in each day. Every single person has 24 hours in each day. And let's just say that you sleep eight of those hours. Okay, eight of those hours are you sleeping, and so that leaves you with 16 hours left. 16 hours left in the day. What are you doing in those 16 hours? How are you spending the rest of the time that God has given you? You actually should track that one day, and I'm not suggesting us turn that into a, a legalistic type of exercise where we're recording our time spent with God, but I do believe it will be beneficial for us to see how effectively we are using our time. How effectively are we using our time? That's 16 hours. What are we doing with that time? Who or what gets the majority of our time? Paul says, for me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. Let's not fall into the category of Philippians 2.21 where Paul says, for all seek their own. Everybody's seeking their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? See, we, we, we go through this life, we, we go through this life doing what we want to do, living how we want to live, putting everything and everyone before Christ. And then we, we wonder and we're shocked and we're surprised why, we're not, why we are knocked flat on our butts when a storm comes. When the spiritual attack comes and knocks us right out. It's because we have no foundation we have no spiritual foundation. When the storm comes, Netflix and TV won't sustain us. Sports won't get the job done. Money won't satisfy us. People won't even be reliable. All the things that we put before God, when the storm comes, they let us down. There's only one person who's able to get the job done, and that's Jesus Christ. For us to live is Christ. Outside of Christ, in all actuality, we really have no life. Outside of Christ, we have no life. Paul says in Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life? Paul says Christ is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Can we honestly say that Christ is our life? 
Can we say that Christ is our life? Is he the consuming thought of our minds? And don't get me wrong, we can have a job, we can have a family, we can have hobbies and interests and all that. That's, that's cool, that's beautiful stuff. Love life, enjoy your life, but we cannot let it get to the point where the job consumes us or the family consumes us or the relationship consumes us or the hobbies or interests consume us because then Christ is no longer our life he is just a part of it. He's just a part of our life. Wherein the opposite should be, say, should be said, where Christ is our life and the job, the family, the hobby, those are just a part of it. Christ is our life. And so our focus needs to be on, okay, how can, how can, we, how can I glorify God on, on my job? How can I glorify God in my family? How can I glorify God while I'm participating in this hobby or in this interest that I have? You see, Christ can and should still be glorified in all those things, in all those things. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, whatever you do, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom, where? In the grave. And then he finishes up, whether thou goest. So he's saying you're going to the grave. OK, understand you're going to the grave. Let's let's make that clear. But understand in the grave, there's no work. There's no device. There's no knowledge. There's no wisdom. So just you're going to the grave, but none of that stuff is there. Philippians 121 for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We do not have to fear death. We do not have to fear death. As believers in Christ, everything literally gets better for us. Everything gets better for us. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 56. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to us the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. And so do you know now that death it, it serves as our transportation into heaven? Death serves us now. We, we only get to heaven through death. There is no other way that we get to heaven. Death is now our servant because Jesus is sacrificed on the cross because of Jesus' victory over death and the grave. So now death now serves us. So we don't have to fear our servant. Death is our servant. Paul says in Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through who? Through who? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the victory through him. So it's through that victory that death now becomes our servant. So what is our response to that? What's our response to that? Well, he says it in the next verse. Therefore, for the reason I said all of that, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In other words, while we are here, for us to live is Christ. For us to live is Christ. There is no thing and there is no one who should take priority over him in this life. And if that's the case, if that's the case for you, if nothing is taking priority over him, then to die will be your gain. If you need to give your life to Christ today, do that. If that's something you need to do, do that. Give your life to him. If you've already done that and you need to live your life for Christ today, start doing that. Either give your life or start living your life for Christ. You see, whatever we think is more important than him on this earth, understand that he sees, he knows, 
and we will give an account for it. We're going to give an account for it. Imagine standing before Christ. Imagine standing before God on the throne and saying, well, God, I, I, I could have spent more time with you. I, I could have spent more time with you, but I wanted to wash my shows instead. Or I, I could have spent more time with you, or maybe I even wanted to spend more time with you, but I needed to make more money. I wanted to spend more time with you, but I, I needed to establish my, my, my place or my status in this world. I needed to establish my status in my city. I wanted to spend more time with you, but I was really feeling this girl or for the females, I was really feeling this guy. And, and she began consuming all of my time and we we're going on dates and we we're going to the movies. And I didn't really have time for you anymore. Or, or what if your response is, I wanted to spend more time with you, but I was having too much fun living in sin. You see, we're going to give an account. We're going to give an account. And when we get there, don't think that, don't think that we'll be able to lie. Because he already knows anyway. And so it's going to be full disclosure, full honesty on why we did not spend or why for us to live was not Christ. Make sure, make sure that you're ready for that day. Make sure that you're ready for that day when you're going to give an account on who really was God in your life. Who was the Lord of your life? Who was in charge of your life. Like, I, like we looked at, Paul says when Christ, who is our life? Christ is our life. And so for us to live is Christ. And if that's the case, to die will be our gain. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. God, thank you for your word. There may be some changes that need to be made in our life, God. There may be some changes that need to be made in our daily interactions, our daily dialogue, our daily conversation, our daily communing with you. Thank you that we have an opportunity to change. Give us the courage to change. Give us the courage to not be the person that we were a year ago, a month ago, a week ago, a day ago. Help us to get better. Help us and, and yeah, we understand our flesh is dying. Our flesh is getting worse and worse, God. But our spirit is being renewed day by day. We're getting better. We're getting closer to you. We're getting closer to eternity with you. Yeah, we can celebrate that, God. But there may be somebody who cannot. There may be somebody who cannot celebrate that they are getting closer and closer to you, but it's going to be the other side of you. It's going to be the, the, the judgment side of you. It's going to be the, 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 the fear and trembling side of you. God, speak to their heart right now. And I know you're speaking, God, but give them the courage to say yes to you. Help us, help us to be vessels for you that, that, that you can use us. People see us, but when they see us, help us to point to you. You are the answer. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. You are everything to us. So we love you and we thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.